Good morning, everybody. Pull this up so I can see it. I just wish that, I just hope that everyone had a very Merry Christmas, that it was filled with lots of laughter, lots of joy, peace, family, but most of all, I hope that it was filled with Jesus Christ. And I hope that Santa Claus was very good to each and every one of you and that you did not get coal in your stocking because I can only imagine that would really suck. Now, one thing that is associated with this time of the year of Christmas is the word gifts. Whether they're costly gifts, whether they're gifts from the heart, cute gifts, if it involves this word gifts, it is usually being talked about during this type of the year. Now, the ad companies, they thrive off of this for they want you to spend as much money as possible to get the best gift possible. Now, the past couple of weeks, we have been talking about gifts that God gives to us. Not gifts that we can buy for others, but gifts that God has given each and every one of us graciously. And over the past couple of weeks, we have spoke about gifts of joy, peace, hope, love, and on Christmas Eve, we spoke about the gift of Jesus Christ. We talked about the gifts that God has given us that no matter how hard we try, we can never repay. But just because we can't repay them does not mean that we shouldn't go out and strive to give Christ the great gifts like he has given us great gifts. Now, I was reading over the, on the internet the past couple of days, and there was a story about a li little seven-year-old boy. And just before church, he was having a conversation with his parents about if he could bring his teddy bear to church. And his parents were like, no, you probably shouldn't bring that to church. But after a lengthy discussion, they finally agreed and let him take that little bear to church. So as church was going on and the offering plate was being passed around, he went and he put his teddy bear in the offering plate. So at the end of church, as they were driving home in the car, the parents out of curiosity, they asked, so why did you put your bear in the offering plate? And he said, well, I was reading in the Bible the other day, and it was about these magi, and about how they gave Jesus gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And he's like, well, I didn't have any gold, and I don't know what the heck myrrh is, so I gave him frank and sense. Now, just like this little boy, the Bible tells us about a story of the magi in Matthew 2, 1-12, who gave little baby Jesus such magnificent gifts, which is going to be our text today. But before we get into our text, I'd like us all to pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the many gifts that you give us so graciously. We thank you for the gift of Jesus Christ and how you sent him as a little baby boy to come into this world who loved us so much and who gave his life for each and every one of us, dear Lord. We just thank you for the gifts, and we thank you for the many gifts that we give the opportunity throughout this life to give back to you. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you that you give us the victory, dear Lord. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. So today I'll be reading Matthew 2, 1 to 12 from the NIV. And it says, After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed in all Jerusalem with him. When he had called together all the people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them, Where is the Christ, where the Christ was to be born? In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied, For this is what the prophet had written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd of all my people. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the little child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. That was a big lie in itself. But after they had heard the king, they went on their way, and the stars they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. Now when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened up their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense 
and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. Now in our text today, we see how the Magi, they came to Herod to see where this little baby boy had been born. Now the thing was, this wasn't just any regular old little baby boy. The Magi say that this baby boy was born king of the Jews. So Herod, he starts freaking out like this little girl. And he gets all the wisdom from all the smart people in the town to come together. And he's trying to figure out what the heck he's supposed to do. And this little baby boy, he had a birthright to be king. Unlike Herod, who got his way to kingship by wars and stuff like that. So Herod was freaking out a little bit. Now another thing which we can know about Herod is how he was very paranoid that someone was going to steal his kingship. So much so that he had anyone who even had a chance to steal his kingship murdered. He murdered his wife and he murdered three of his sons. Augustus, who was the Roman emperor, once said that Herod's, it was better to be Herod's pig than to be Herod's son. I think you can say on that part he's probably not father of the year. And you could also say that this dude was very power crazy. But one thing that we have to ask ourselves is, Why would Herod even believe these magi? Why would he believe what they are saying? Well, as we see these magi, they are also referred to as wise men, depending on the translation that we're reading. These wise men, they were educated Gentiles and astronomers who studied the stars. They also served in the royal courts, and they were valuable advisors due to their great knowledge of science, agriculture, and also of sorcery. And did you know that in the 6th century, on a mosaic art piece that was found in Italy that it had the wise men's supposed names on them. Their names were Melchior, Casper, and Balthazar. I like Balthazar, if you couldn't tell. But these names, we don't know if they're the actual names of them. This is a question that we'll have to ask God when we get to heaven. But we also see that the Greek word for magi is also in Acts 13, 6 to, 7, 6 to 11, and there's a variation of the word that is found in Acts 8, 9 to 24. And it translates this word as magician or sorcerer. And when we think of magicians or sorcerers, we usually think of those magicians that are out in the street corners doing all those fancy card tricks, or they're pulling bunnies out of these hats. But as we see throughout the Bible that these magicians and sorcerers, that they were so much more than this, We see that they were able to turn staffs into snakes. We see that they were able to bring an abundance of frogs up onto the land. We see that they were able to turn the waters red like blood. They did also many things with evil spirits too. Now one thing to note about the Jewish people is that they would have seen these magi as working with these awful magic powers that had demonic powers behind them. In other words, they saw these magi as people who were far from the kingdom of God. So for the wise men to follow this star that led them to where Jesus was, to give Jesus such amazing gifts, it shows that God calls all to Jesus. Now when the wise men gave Jesus these amazing gifts, we see that they were gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So today I would like to explore into the meaning of these gifts have and what they say about who Jesus is. Now, in this text, it says in verse 11 that these gifts were given as an act of worship. And gifts like this, they would have been given to honor someone of this high standard, like a king or someone like that. And the first gift that I would like to venture into was the gift of gold. Now, gold, it was such a valuable thing like it is today in the ancient world. Along with frankincense and myrrh, these all would have been gifts that were given to someone of high standing. Someone who was distinguished above all the rest of the people. Now in verse 2 we see that the Magi, they came asking where this, where this king of the Jews was to be born. These Magi knew that he was not someone who was going to become king. Because they knew that he already had the birthright. He already had this royal heritage behind him. Now the gift of gold we see it was also given to Solomon by Queen Shab- Shabia along with many other gifts whenever she came to him. We also see that gold is used in many biblical passages, and we see that it was also involved in the making of the temple. 
We also see that in Daniel 2.38 that the Babylonian Empire, because of the many riches that it had and how powerful it was, that it was called the head of gold. And in Isaiah 14.4, it was referred to as the golden city. Gold, though they had a lot of it back then, it was considered a great and costly thing to have. Making gold a great gift to receive. Making gold a gift fit for a king. Now, when it comes to gifts, I'd like to say, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty okay with it. But we all know that one person who wants to give everyone they give a present to the perfect gift. Something that symbolizes who that person is. And they would probably rather give them nothing than give them a gift that doesn't represent who they are. Now, when we look to ourselves in the gifts that we give God, we need to ask ourselves, what are the gifts that we are giving to God? Say about his kingship? Are the gifts that we are giving to God say that he is the king, or do they say that he is a lowly shepherd boy? What do they say about God and his kingship? The second gift that I'd like to look at today is frankincense, or as Cy Robertson off of Duck Dynasty called it, frankincense. He called it frankincense because franken is a prefix, like Frankenstein or frankenbeans, and he said it was franken and then scent because in essence it's a scent and he wasn't too far off the line there frankincense it is an aroma that is very pleasing it's an aramaic gum resin that is still widely used in parts of the middle east in africa today and it is produced by scraping the bark of certain native species of trees and then harvesting the beads of resin after they have dried up frankincense when it is all put together It is known for its aroma qualities. What one does is they go and they light it, and as it burns, it lets off this great aroma that is usually pleasing to the nose. And in ancient near times, because of the cost of it, they weren't allowed to use it as a home air freshener like we do as Febreze. So when people burn this frankincense, they would have associated with ceremonial worship of a king or some sort of deity or god. It was associated with worshiping something. And for the Jews, the priests, they had control to do with most of the stuff that was happening in the temple and stuff like that. So they would have been in charge of these aromas and frankincense and stuff. And in the Bible, there are many times when God says that these aromas are pleasing to him in worship, that he loves the smell of these aromas. So when the wise men gave Jesus the gift of frankincense, they could have easily known what the Old Testament passage, which they quoted in verse 6 that came from Micah 5, 2, that it was much more than just about this newborn king, but it carried a claim of his priestly duty with it. They could have known based on the gifts and what it was associated with that it meant that Jesus was much more than just a baby, but it showed his priestly duty and him being the mediator between us and God. It shows that Jesus is much higher than each and every one of us and he is worthy to be praised, which begs the question, does our gifts to Jesus show that we believe in his priesthood? Does our gifts to Jesus show that we believe that he is the mediator between us and God? Or does the gifts show that Jesus is just another person, that he has the same association with a fry cook? And I'm not talking about SpongeBob SquarePants, which is known all throughout Bikini Bottom, just the lowly old fry cook. Yes, these people, they do good jobs most of the time, but are we going to treat God in this same way? For these Gentiles, those who were away from God, those who had no part or share in the inheritance as the Israelites did, those who practiced sorcery, these are the people who gave Jesus the gifts that they gave, the gifts that Jesus deserved. These are not just some people that Jesus came to die on the the cross for. Jesus came to die on the cross for everyone, which brings me to the gift of myrrh which I would love to believe was given by Balthazar because, once again, I believe his name is the coolest out of the three of them. Myrrh, it is a fragrant spice that is made from the sap of a tree that is native to the Near East. It is like frankincense in the way that it gives off this great fragrance or incense. But when we look at it in the ancient world, it is used for such things as perfume and anointing oil and for medical purposes as well. 
But when we look into what myrrh means in the life of Jesus Christ, we see that in John 19, 39 to 40, that myrrh was one of the main ingredients that got Jesus' body ready for burial. For back in the day, myrrh was used in the preparation for dead bodies. Now, it was quite possible that the wise men presented Jesus with this gift of myrrh to symbolize what he had come to this earth to do. That Jesus had come to this earth to do exactly what the prophets had prophesied in the Old Testament. And in Isaiah 53, 5, that says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. It is not known whether the men knew what this sacrifice was or whether this gift, what the symbolism behind it, but what they did know is that Jesus, he was the next big thing, that he was something great, that he was something big. They probably didn't know what he came to this earth to do or what he was going to do, but they knew that these gifts that they gave him associated some kind of weight behind them. And the last thing that they gave, which can be overlooked a lot of the time, is about how they gave him the gift of worship. Now it says in verse 11 that before they gave these three gifts to Mary on behalf of Jesus, that they worshipped. These three gifts, they all could have been a form of worship, just them in itself. But we see that before they even gave anything, that they fell down on their knees, as the Greek says, and they worshipped Jesus. They hit their knees to worship someone with special honor or respect associated with them. They worship God even before they gave their gifts of offering to him. So when we give something in our own lives, whether that's helping out with the children's program, whether that's speaking, whether that's helping the old lady across the street, whatever these things are, before we do these things, do we take the time to get down on our knees, humble ourselves before the Almighty, and praise and worship him? Or do we just give these things that we give? When we give these things that we give, do we remember who we are giving them to and what we are giving them for? Now, when asked someone why they tied, they simply responded with, well, that's what I'm supposed to do, isn't it? Which, yes, that is right. But there's also so much stuff behind why you're supposed to tie. There's a reason behind it. Now, these wise men, they all remembered why and for whom they gave such great gifts to Jesus. These men, they didn't know much about what Jesus had come to do. They only knew that he was this big, powerful person and gave these amazing gifts to worship with him. When we think about it, these wise men, all they knew was that Jesus was king of the Jews. That's really all we know that they knew about Jesus. But yet they came and they delivered him such amazing gifts. Now, I was watching Duck Dynasty the other day, and it was a Christmas special. And Willie, the CEO of Duck Commander, he was trying to get his wife the perfect Christmas gift. And like most men, he had a pretty bad track record, but he was trying to really make up for it this year. So he was scrolling through Amazon on his iPad, trying to get the perfect gift, and two of his brothers walks in the room, and one of them's having the same trouble trying to figure out what his wife wants, and the other one has it in the bag. So they're trying to figure out what to get them, and the youngest son of the bunch pipes up and he says, you want to know what to get your wife for Christmas? He said, just listen to her. Just listen to her, and she will tell you what she wants. And who knew? This advice worked. Willie listened to her, and through the past, and through knowing her, and through experiencing life with her, he was able to know exactly the perfect gift to get which was a big, blown-up family portrait of all of them, and she ended up loving it. Willie knew a lot about his wife from the years of knowing her. Now, when we look into our own lives, no matter how long we've known Jesus, we still know something about him. We, unlike the wise men, we know who Jesus is and what he came to this earth to do. We know what Jesus' sacrifice meant on the cross and what excruciating pain he had to go through to save our sins. Now, we know that he is a king, we know that he is God, and we know what his death and resurrection means for each and every one of us. We know these things, but do these things impact who we are? So do we give gifts to Jesus that are fit for a king?
Do we give gifts to Jesus that are fit for someone who gave his life for us? Do we give gifts that show the love that Jesus showed to each and every one of us? Or do we give gifts that not even ourselves would want to receive? For the greatest gift of them all was a little baby boy wrapped up in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, who grew up to be a man of God, to take our place to die a gruesome death to save us from our sins. God gave us the ultimate gift ever that can never be repaid. All of this, God, he gave us so many amazing gifts, and it is all of ours to take. All we have to do is call on the name of the Lord and follow him. So the questions that we have to ask ourselves today is, what are our presence to God saying about who we believe he is? Do our gifts to him say that he is a king? Do our gifts to him say that he is the one and only God, that he is the high priest, the redeemer who redeemed us by his death and resurrection? And do our gifts say that he is worthy to be praised? Or do our gifts say something else about Jesus? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you were. We thank you for sending your son Jesus down to this earth to die a grimsome death for each and every one of us and to resurrect the third day. We thank you for everything that you do for us. We thank you for who you are, and we thank you for those magi who came that day, dear Lord. We thank you for their amazing gifts that they gave to you. We thank you for the gifts that we give to you. We just pray that they would just show us exactly who we think you are, dear Lord. And if they are not pleasing to you, may we smarten up, dear Lord, and give you gifts that are fit for a king, that we would give you gifts fit to represent that you're the high priest, that we would just give you gifts that represent exactly who you are. For you gave us the ultimate gift, dear Lord, by sending your little baby boy, Jesus, down to this earth for each and every one of us. Thank you for the unpayable gift. And may we just spend every day, dear Lord, repaying, trying to repay you, trying to give you gifts that honor and glorify you, living the life that you want each and every one of us to live. Thank you, dear Lord. Thank you so much. It's in your name we pray. Amen.